The short era of the car of tomorrow was one of great change and turbulence. Virtually nothing from before its release was the same afterwards, but during this phase there were some absolutely crazy and fun moments. And these races from 2007 COT races all the way through 2012 were some of the best that NASCAR's ever had. For this list, I'm going to be looking back at the top 10 races that I think define this era and are the best of this era. While subjective in nature, I will try to be as objective as possible. While some races have some pretty great moments, they may not have been all that great leading up to the finish. So with that being said, let's take a look at the top 10 races of the COT era. At number 10, we have the 2011 Goodies Fast Relief 500 from the Martinsville Speedway. A Martinsville race will always be great. Even the bad ones are usually in the top 10 of a season's races. So having a race from the track on this list shouldn't be a surprise. In April of 2011, the Cup Series was headed to the Half Mile Virginia facility with the fastest start the sport had had in probably half a decade. For the first 200 laps or so of the race, it was par for the course of a normal Martinsville race. That was until a huge impact with Martin Truex Jr. and Casey Kane. From there, the pieces began to fit into place until a 29 lap dash to the finish saw three major players. The bad boy of Kyle Busch who would scamper off with the lead, Mr. Popular Dale Earnhardt Jr. who was in the midst of a 98 race winless streak, and the closer Kevin Harvick who had won the week before in an absolute thriller. With the aforementioned Busch being chased down by Earnhardt, it meant that they would have a coming together. With 21 to go, the 88 moved the 18 to the cheers of 60,000 in attendance. But the jubilation was short-lived as Harvick ended up catching Junior with five to go after charging up from fourth. It was only a precursor of what was to come in 2011. At number nine, we have the very first COT race, the 2007 Food City 500. The car tomorrow had been talked about since 2004 in NASCAR media. So where better to debut it than the Bristol Motor Speedway in front of 160,000 fans? This Bristol race was typical in many ways with 15 cautions, including plenty of crashes. Tony Stewart had the race in hand before issues with his car took him out of contention. And after a late caution came out, a green white checker would decide the race. With this, Jeff Burton immediately jumped past Jeff Gordon for second and was setting his sights on leader Kyle Busch. The two raced side by side for a lap and a half, and then Bush would win in the closest Bristol finish ever. It was a great success, even if Bush did say that it sucked. At number eight, we're gonna jump back up to 2011 for the 2011 Advocare 500 at Atlanta. This race is currently the last true great Atlanta race. A perfect mix of old pavement, high horsepower, and legendary drivers fighting for a win. The race was postponed to Tuesday due to rain, but once the racing got underway, it was the Atlanta of the early to mid 2000s, slipping and sliding all like the cars were on ice. Whether it was a long green run or a restart, these cars were incredibly hard to drive. This all came down to a battle in the closing laps between Jeff Gordon and Jimmy Johnson. While Johnson had dominated the previous half decade, he would end up being the chaser here slipping and sliding all the way home. The result being Gordon's 85th victory, putting him in the sole ownership of the third spot on NASCAR's all-time win list. With number seven, we have to go back to 2008, the 2008 Bristol Night Race. This race was wild from the get-go as Dale Earnhardt Jr. jumped the start, and he'd remain a lap down throughout the night. Throughout the race, there were a few crashes, the pinnacle of these being on lap 217, which involved seven drivers. Clint Boyer being the most remembered due to his famous reaction. He would call Michael Waltrip, quote, the worst driver in NASCAR, period. But as funny as that was, the shining moment of the race would be the battle for the win between Kyle Busch and Carl Edwards. Busch led almost the entire night but Edwards would end up moving the 18 for the race winning pass. The two would go back and forth even after the race with Edwards again beating the younger Bush. At number six, we're gonna stay in 2008 with the 2008 Aaron's 499. This race followed up 
a snoozer Talladega race in the fall of 2007, but a thrilling 2008 Daytona 500 finish. And it far exceeded both of those standards. The lead was a revolving door as the two-car tango was just starting to get its footing in the draft. Only three drivers really could stay up front for extended periods of time. Denny Hamlin, Dale Earnhardt Jr., and Tony Stewart. But they would all either be shuffled out or crashed out at different points of the race. The first two of these three even had a bit of a scuffle back and forth in the closing stages of the event. Kyle Busch and Jamie McMurray also had an insane moment where it looked like the two should have wrecked, but they didn't. Busch would go on to win the race. And this race is just as good, if not better, than any of the early 2000s Dega races, and it's insanely underrated. At number 5, we get a fast forward now to 2012 for the Finger Lakes 355 at the Glen. The last road course race of the COT era was an absolute beauty. The strategy was the main chess game of the first part of the event, and it was a good one at that. It was like the 2011 running of the race. But what sets it apart from 2011 is that one had a true and real finish, the 2012 edition. With a few laps to go, Bobby Labonte would put oil down on the track as well. Kyle Busch, Brad Keselowski, and Marco Zambros would then have to fight for the win while trying to keep control of their cars. He tries to get the lead from Kyle. Oh, Contact in the S's. And Clyde got it. Dangerous spot on the track for Kyle to be sideways. Looks like he gets off to the guardrail. And will the nine help him? Oh, Everybody's in the grass. grass. Oh, oh, yeah. clear. Dig, dig, dig. That dig, might dig. have been the race right there. We'll no. see. No, Keselowski's slower. <laughs> Keselowski's got a problem. Trying to stay with Ambrose. Two final corners. Do they use the bumpers? A nod, a push. Can Ambrose save it? To the checkered flag. Who gets here first? Clear, clear. Ambrose, nine. Keselowski, two. Final corner. An underrated part of this finish is that Ambrose and Keselowski both were not upset at one another. It was just hard racing. At number four, we have the longest race on this list, the 2011 Coca-Cola 600. This race had two things that the 600 rarely has anymore, side-by-side -side racing throughout the event and lead changes. Throughout the night, comers and goers continued to be a running drama. Much like other races in 2011 though, the finish would come down to fuel mileage. Greg Biffle, Casey Kane, Dale Earnhardt Jr. and Matt Kenseth were in contention before the final caution led to the legendary finish to this race. What a topsy-turvy finish to the Coca-Cola 600. And Dale Jr. is scooting away. Uh-oh, uh oh he's slowing, isn't he? 150,000 people on their feet. Jr. Earnhardt. is slowing, he's out of fuel. He's out he's of gas. Out of gas. And as that Indy, the leader at turn four does not get to the flag. Perfect, perfect, the closer wins it. At number three on this list, we have our final super speedway race, the 2010 Aaron's 499. While the 2009 and 2011 finishes may be more legendary and famous, this race was crazy all the way through to the max. The tandem draft only had strengthened in this race, but the cars did not fully link up going all the way around the track, meaning that we did have a hybrid between pack and tandem racing. This led to a record 88 lead changes among 29 drivers. Yes, 29 of the 43 drivers in the field led at least one lap in this race. That is over 67%, over two-thirds of the field. Also, this was the first cup race in history to have three green-white checker attempts. Instead of 188 laps like it was scheduled, it would be a 200-lap Talladega race. It was worth the wait, though, due to the finish. At runner-up on this list, we have the 2012 Bristol Night Race. From the start, it was destined to be memorable. Casey Mears actually started from the pole in the 13 car and led the first 26 laps. Afterwards, throughout the night, crashes defined the night. The top of the list being between two champions, 
Matt Kenseth, and Tony Stewart. He couldn't get his slot, slide job to work quite as good. It's a lot of contact. Oh, though. no. There they go. Driving in probably a little too hard. Tony not very happy. Whoa. Now, gosh. Looks familiar. Well, we know what Tony thinks. There was also a run-in between Danica Patrick and Regan Smith, but it paled in comparison to the one between Stewart and Kenseth. But long term, what was this race representing? Well, it represented the change in Bristol racing forever. After fans showed displeasure with the reconfigured Bristol racing, SMI decided to ground up the top groove of the track to try and keep the racing down low like the old Bristol. Instead, it made the top a premium commodity and it has remained that way to this day, to the point they had to put PJ1 now on the bottom of the track. So now, with all of these ones being said, let's go and see some of our honorable mentions. I don't know. I don't think he can step out until he waits till the last second and picks he up. He's going to get out side. Is Edwards going to oh, go no. He turns it. No, no. Oh, and that no. destroyed the front end of Newman's car. No. He's he to the bottom. Oh, he just wanted to touch him, man. Just wanted to touch him. Can't get him to the right side. side. Here he comes. No, there he, he turns it. He but turns it. Oh, in the wall. Oh, my God. Here comes Stewart to the checkered Tony flag. Stewart. And another and car gets in the backside. It's Casey Kane. And they're scattering everywhere. To get alongside Harvick. Here he comes. The momentum. You can't beat it. Clint Boyer and Brad Kozlowski trying to steal one here. Green flag. Look at Ryan Newman. He, he gave Boyer a shot getting in. Uh, there goes and Newman. Oh, Newman's going to take the lead. Michael Waltrip in the 55. Pushed by Casey Mears. Kenseth with Harvard behind him. Oh, oh, there's contact. Stewart into the middle of the pack and over. Now, for our number one race of the COT era. A race that actually changed NASCAR forever. The 2011 Ford 400. Heading into this race, it was a two-man title fight. Carl Edwards in the 99 car led Tony Stewart's 14 by a mere three points. Edwards started from the pole, while Stewart started from 15th. But early on, a hole got punched in through the grill of Smoke's car, causing him to need to pit multiple times and need to restart from the back multiple times as well. While the 14 took cars three, four, and even five wide on his hard charge to the front, Carl Edwards logged off more and more laps led, locking up bonus points for leading laps and for the most laps led. This basically meant that Stewart would need to win the race to get a chance at a title victory. And that's exactly what he did. For the final 37 laps, the two checked out from the field and played a cat and mouse game. And it led to the 14 and 99 finishing 1-2, tying for the championship. Due to Tony Stewart having five wins to Carl Edwards one, Smoke won the title. This race had it all. A nail-biting championship battle, multi-groove racing throughout the race and the day, and insane restarts all on top. It also served as a baseline for the winner-take-all championship format that we have today. For all of this, the 2011 Ford 400 is the greatest race of the COT era. Now, enough from me. I want to hear from you. What is your top 10 races of the COT era list like? Let me know down in the comments below. And while you are at it, leave a like and subscribe to my channel for more great NASCAR content. And until next time, have a good one.